we're going to be starting the CSP's problem. Uh, it's this CSP problem is framed in the context of a time management problem. So uh, a brief overview, we have two TAs, Arjun and Dave. They're trying to make their schedule and they have five tasks. So F, pick up food, H, prepare homework, P, prepare a robot called a PR2, S, lead a research seminar, and T, teach preschoolers. Okay. So the idea is that for these TAs, we're trying to schedule their morning. So this means from 8 a.m., 9 a.m., so there, it's a one-hour chunk, so it's 8 to 9, 9 to 10, 10 to 11, and 11 to 12. And then there's a couple of constraints. So um, the first one, it means that each TA can do at most one task. This is framed in the idea that, um, like, obviously, if Arjun's doing something at 8, like he's picking up food at 8 a.m., he also cannot prepare homework at 8 a.m. Two, we want the PR2 preparation to happen before the preschoolers. Three, we want the food to happen before the seminar. So these two are like P less than T, F less than S. Seminar should be finished by 10 a.m. Arjun was not going to do the food because, Arjun is going to do the food, sorry, because he has the car. So that means that F has to be A, Arjun. And then six, we, the TA not leading the seminar should still attend, so that means that um, both TAs are going to be gone for the same time to attend the seminar. The seminar will not teach the preschoolers, so S person, SP, is not equal to TP, T person. Number eight, the person who teaches the preschooler must also do the PR2 robot, so that means that TP is equal to P person. And then um, both homework and uh, teaching the preschoolers will take two consecutive hours. Okay, so how are we going to formulate this problem? The idea is that for each of the tasks, we are going to go have, so for, for each of the tasks, like F, H, uh, let's see, what was it? F, H, P, S, T, we're gonna have a domain of eight variables for each. Now why eight? This is because we're going to be having um, one per for a time slot and one for a TA. So the D domain will look something like A8, A9, A10, A11, and the same will apply for Dave. So then it will be D8, etc. So in total, eight of them. A8 means Arjun's time slot at 8 a.m. D8 means Dave's time slot at 8 a.m. So what is the safe space? Because there's eight, do eight values in the domain and there's five tasks overall, this brings us to a total size of state space of eight to the fifth because this is the number of possible assignments that we can have. We want to know which of these constraints include unary constraints. So the answer for this is the constraint number four because we have that S should be finished by 10 a.m. So this means that um, our seminar can only occur at eight or nine, so this will and then number five, Arjun is going to deal with the food pickups since he has a car. So that means that D8, D9, D10, and D11 will not be in the domain for the food pickup F because Arjun is doing it. Okay, the second two are a bit more complex. It's number nine and 10. We can see that these include unary constraints because they both take two hours, so you cannot start at 11 a.m. Otherwise, you won't be able to finish by the time the warning's over. But these also include binary constraints. For example, um, if we end up trying removing A9 from a domain, so we have A9, A10, A11. For Arjun, for example, if we remove A9, then we also have to remove A8 because you can't go do the homework at 8 if you also have something at 9 because the homework, as I said, takes two consecutive hours. So this sort of is more formally. We are formulating it such that um, if we if this variable will not conflict if the one after it is free unless it is 10 a.m. because we're going to be directly just pruning 11 from the very beginning. So um, let's see. We have that the domain, the time, a dot t, so a dot t must have, uh, for a dot t, a dot t plus one must be open, unless it's 11. Same will apply for Dave. I just didn't write it because it's the same thing, same concept. Okay, so we just went over the unary constraints. It might be more clear be in one part we do part C because part C we're actually enforcing these unary constraints. Um, right, so, we're going to be working on this table, so looking at part D, what we have. Okay, so the food, number four, or this, or sorry, number four is the seminar should be finished by 10 a.m. So what this means is that we look at seminar S, and we remove uh, A10 and A11 
as well as D10 and D11, because we cannot have it 10 or after, we want it be to be done before then. Okay, so then number five is the food one. So Arjun is gonna do the food because he has the car. So that means Dave doesn't need to worry about this at all, and we can remove all of Dave's time slots for the food pickup. Okay, then we're moving on to number nine and number 10. This is the two consecutive hour constraint, remember? And so this means that we will be removing a11 and d11 from teaching the preschoolers as well as a11 and d11 from oh sorry this is the wrong row we're, but we're removing a11 and d11 from uh task h which is uh, preparing the homework questions as to why we're doing that it's because if we start at 11 a.m to do the homework or to go teach the preschoolers again we won't be able to finish before the morning is over all right, so my apologies, it seems like I may have erased the x over d10 when I was erasing uh, the incorrect row I made, but d10 should be crossed out in uh, addition to d8, d9, and d11 because Arjun is taking care of the food and not Dave. Okay, so moving on to part d, we're going to be performing forward checking. So um, before we perform forward checking, remember that we still enforce unary constraints. So we're going to copy over the x's that we made from the part above. So that means crossing out d, a11, and d11. Uh, nothing for the p, but a10 and a11 for the seminar, d10 and d11 for the seminar, as well as e11 and d11 for the preschoolers. Okay. So then, then we can do the assignment step. So we want to assign a9 to s. Okay, an assignment also means that the rest of the variables, values in the domain um, are crossed out because they can't be assigned anymore. Okay. So remember that forward checking is a limited form of arc consistency where we go enforce all the arcs that are pointing to S. So that gives us F to S, H to S, P to S, and T to S. Okay, and although there's only one arc, one arc encapsulates um, a lot of uh, constraints. So F to S, for one, we have to enforce that since uh, Arjun is teaching at nine at the seminar, he can't be picking up food at nine at the seminar. And then we also notice that they have the additional constraint number uh, number three, the food should be before picked up before the seminar. Since the food seminar is happening at nine now, that gives us only one option, we have to pick it up at eight, and that means we can't do A10 or A11 for the food pickup. Okay. All right, moving on, then we want to go enforce the arc H2S. So again, we have to enforce the and constraint that since Arjun's doing the seminar at nine, he can't be uh, doing the task H at nine. So you cross out A9. And then we also notice that there's the constraint, um, let's see, constraint number six, the T not leading the seminar should still attend. So this means that even though Dave isn't teaching the seminar at nine, he can't be doing something else at nine as well. So we cross out that. Okay, at this point we notice again, this is the slightly tricky constraint where homework actually takes two hours to do. And so this relates to a constraint that if uh, we want to go, that the variable a dot t only works if a dot t plus one is free. So the time slot nine only works if 10 o'clock is free and uh, so we notice that in this case, we have to remove D8 and A8 from the values of H of the homework because we can't do eight o'clock because they're both busy at nine. Okay. So moving on, now we're doing the P to S arc. And in this situation, we have that P is affected by constraint six. So the TA not leading the seminar should still attend. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we're going to be removing A9 and D9 to account for this. Okay, so then uh, we're gonna enforce the final arc T to S. And in this situation, we again cross out A9 and D9 according to the constraints we listed above, but there's also a special constraint for this one in that um, the seminar does not need to teach the preschoolers T, or the seminar leader will not teach the preschoolers T. So since Arjun is in charge of doing the seminar, he doesn't need to worry about the preschoolers at all. Oops, and that is an X. So this is what it should look like after we enforce for checking. And the very last constraint that we have to enforce in T to S is that T will also note also takes two hours 
So due to a similar reasoning as in homework, we will cross off D8. Okay, and then this is what it should look like after we finish enforcing forward checking. Moving on to part E, you may have noticed that the page jumped, but this is because E builds on top of D, so I copied over the table, uh, didn't record that. Okay, so this wants us to go choose a variable to assign next and run forward checking on that. So MRV, or doing MRV, this stands for minimum remaining values. Sort of intuitively, this means that we want to assign next the variable that has the fewest remaining values in its domain. Okay, so this simply means that we can go look, we see that t and f both have only one value remaining, and we are, since we're breaking ties alphabetically, that means we're going to decide to go assign a h first instead of d10. So this means variable f is selected and gets assigned value a8. Okay, now we want to run forward checking. So as mentioned before, forward checking is just a limited form of arc consistency where we enforce arcs pointing to the variable we just assigned. I'm not going to go through all the arcs this time because we managed to enforce mostly everything last time. The only one that really needs to be enforced is P to F. And that's because we need to go enforce that since Arjun's doing something at 8 in food, he cannot be doing something at 8 for the task P. So this gets crossed off. And that's really the only thing that changed between the problems, like the only value that got removed. Okay, hopefully we're clear on what just happened. And then the last subpart of this question is asking, have we arrived at a dead end, i.e. have any of the domains become empty? The answer is no. T still has one value, S has a value, P has two values, um, and then, or three values, sorry, or actually even four. Okay, he has four values, so sorry, it's a bit hard to read. And then H has two values open, and then F still has a value. We just assigned that one. So no, we have not arrived at a dead end. Right, so another small jump, we've moved on to part F. So you may realize that the result in part F, I copied this over from the table in D after we did four checking. Why did I do this? This is because that um, we're trying to run our consistency. So again, our consistency starts out with having enforced the unary constraints. So having the same crossed out values as in C makes sense. Now, I also added the values that we crossed out from part D because again, forward checking is a limited form of our consistency. So the state that the D is in is all about the same thing as what would happen if we ran our consistency and we happen to just enforce those arcs first. Okay, this works because um, we're actually assigning the value A9 from the beginning and then we're enforcing our consistency from there. So I basically just change around the ordering and enforce the first four arcs according to the same reasoning as in part D. Okay, So we can actually go then follow a similar reasoning to part E where we can assign A8, not because we're following the heuristic exactly, but because it only has one value left, so that must be the assignment. So we can assign this. And then we also notice that T has one value left, so we can assign D10. Okay? All right. So we should now enforce all the arcs pointing to F. This is similar to the reasoning in part E again, so we cross out A8 because Arjun can't be doing anything else at 8. And then following a similar reasoning and doing constraint number one for D10, so H to P, H to T, P to T, and yeah, those two, we will prune D10 because again, Dave can't be doing anything at 10 if he's already doing something at 10. Okay? This leaves us with only one value left in H, so we can directly assign that. And then enforcing things that point to H are P to H. And uh, let's see, the rest are all assigned, so we don't need to worry about them. Our consistency is technically, depending on the order in which we enforce arcs, our consistency may still enforce an arc, for example, from like T to F. But since uh, we can already see that these values are compatible, I won't be going to stepping through all these arcs because since this is a fully connected constraint graph, there's a lot of edges. So stepping through full arc consistency with all the arcs would take a really long time. So anyways, we're enforcing P to H. This enforces constraint number one where Arjun can't be doing something else at 10 if he's already doing one task at 10. So we remove that. And then we go look and then we see that P has A11, D8, and D11 left. Okay. So now this gets slightly trickier. We need to go look at all the uh, things that P are pointing to because this is the last value remaining that ha does not have an assigned variable. So um, we notice that if we scroll back to the top, P has the constraints relating to it. P should happen before teaching the preschoolers. P is less than T. 
Let's see, if of course constraint number one applies to it. And then the TA who teaches the preschoolers must also prepare the PR2. Okay. So we have that. Dave is teaching the preschoolers. And so that's task T. And so um, we have that Dave must also be preparing the PR2. So we can cross off A11. So that's the arc P, uh, P to T. Okay. The additional constraint that we have, remember we pointed out PR2 preparation should happen before the preschoolers. So again, so as part of P to T, we remove D11. And this leaves us only D8. And we end up with this ultimate assignment after enforcing our consistency. Okay, now we want to compare the end result from D and from F. Does our consistency remove more values or less values in forward checking? So based on how I set up this problem, it's kind of uh, clear that hopefully that uh, F has less values left, so our consistency removes more. This is because for checking only enforce these arcs that I listed here, but our consistency will enforce more than that. It will enforce the, all the arcs as well as re-adding arcs back if the domain has not been enforced. So we enforced H to T, P to T, P to H, and P to T specifically. Um, as, and we implicitly enforced a bunch of other arcs like T to F, S to F, for example, that wouldn't have made a difference because we know they're compatible. There was only one value left. Okay, so uh, in summary, our consistency removed far more values because we ended up enforcing a lot more arcs than for checking did. So yeah, we checked it between all pairs of variables, which was because all variables had constraints between them, whereas we only enforced four for the for checking. OK, so for the final part of this problem, it's asking us, where is the solution? So this is a little self-evident, again, because of how I did the problem, because I was explicitly stating the assignments as we went. But um, yeah, we ended up with one variable per task in this, uh, or per variable, we ended with one value per variable in this CSP. So that means that the value left in the domain for any variable must be the assignment. So um, yes, we did find a solution along this path. And that is Arjun should pick up the food at 8 AM. Arjun should do the homework at 10 AM. Dave should prepare the PR2 at 8 AM. Uh, let's see, what was S? Oh yeah, a, Arjun should teach the seminar at 9 a.m. and that Dave should teach the preschoolers at 10 a.m. This is the solution to our CSP after we ended up enforcing art consistency.